about doing what you need. And, and I would suggest to you, if people have struggled with the concepts of community and citizenship for all of recorded time, if you go back and look at, at Hammurabi, the lawgiver, or at Moses, if you read Leviticus and the Ten Commandments and that whole process as, as the rise of uh, an effort to come to grips with an urban community, uh, if you look at Confucius' work in uh, China around uh, 400 uh, B.C., the rise of Athenian democracy with, with Aristotle and Plato and the effort to figure out how do people uh, live together, the Roman Republic uh, and the effort to create an orderly world for the entire Mediterranean. And then if, if you come to the capital, you can see a uh, reproduction of the Magna Carta written in 1215 in which the English barons say to King John that if you will concede that you can only get money from us with our consent. This is a very small group now. This is not average people. This was not even knights. This was only the great barons. But they wrote what was called the Magna Carta or Great Charter, and it's the beginning of the change. It's a process by which you begin to have uh, the government recognizing that the consent of the governed matters. And the taxes have to be given because people are willing to be taxed, as opposed to the divine right of kings. Uh, the English Civil War, which is a terrible period in, in, in British history in the mid-16th century, or 17th century, in which uh, you begin again to wrestle with this, what's the power of the king? What's the power of the House of Commons? How, how do people defend their rights? And many of our laws, much of our Constitution, defending you, for example, against being tortured, you can't be forced to testify against yourself, comes directly out of the English Civil War in the sense of the king using what was called a star chamber where you could be taken in and held without the habeas corpus and tortured to force you to confess. And so a lot of the lessons of that period get embedded in the American system. And then, of course, the American Revolution and the Founding Fathers and the writing of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution uh, become our codification of the lessons of freedom. And you have to, I, again, I want to come back to the notion that America is a unique civilization and that part of our uniqueness is the radical statement of where our power comes from. Because remember, you start with the divine right of kings, then the barons sort of fight and say, you got to give us power. Then you have the English Civil War, and there's a tension between commoners and king. But the American system breaks loose and goes to something very different. The American system says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So the assertion is made at the beginning of the American political experience that power comes from God to you, and then you loan power to the government. Which is why, if you go back to the Constitution, we the people decide to form the government. This is not the God gives the king the power, the king then tells you what to do. This is God gave you the power, you then decided to loan it back to form a common government. It's the most radical statement of human rights, I think, ever written in terms of where power comes from. Now, the challenge, however, and what we have not been teaching, I think, since the mid-1960s, is that freedom requires personal strength. You have to have integrity, courage, hard work, perseverance, discipline, respect for yourself and for others, and responsibility. And, and here you get into one of those great test questions about how the world works. If you try to design a government which does not have those values, and I want see if they can put that back up just for one second real quick, John, because I, I want everybody who's watching this on, on, on tape and television to also get a sense of this. What we've tried to do is we've tried for the last 30 years to design a government for people who don't have courage, won't work hard, lack perseverance, have no discipline, uh, have no self-respect and are not willing to be responsible. So we say, how can we design a welfare state for an irresponsible victim without any hope of a better future? And surely you can't actually challenge them to help self-respect and discipline. The whole core of this entire course is that's hopeless. You cannot have a free society in which you have no integrity, no courage, you don't have a work ethic, you're not willing to persevere, you have no discipline and you lack respect for yourself and for others, and you're not willing to be responsible for your actions. It is impossible. It's, it is not, you can't build the formula. And this is at the core of, of, of everything we've tried to say for 20 hours here, that if you start over and you say, okay, I'm gonna stipulate that's what America has to be like, now how do I design a government that works? Then you can get there. 
And when I talk about big words like transformation, this is an example. Designing a government for victims who are irresponsible and unable to take care of themselves is so different from designing a government for people with self-respect, hard work, and perseverance that they're two different worlds, and they're not compatible. Now, let me give you again an example uh, of somebody who personified this commitment and who understood this. And let's look for a second at citizenship as defined by Max Cleland, the Secretary of State of Georgia. But ultimately, you've got to have a passion for it. You've got to really believe that this, this system is yours, that it's, it's truly yours. That seems to be the toughest thing to sell. That's what makes people cynic so cynical today is they really don't believe that. that they think, uh, like Jack Parr said, that uh, the comedian, he said, I don't vote. He said it only encourages them. The Greek uh, word for uh, citizen is politikos. And the word uh, apathy comes from the Greek word meaning idiot. So the Greeks felt that if you didn't participate, you were an idiot. And that if you did participate, you had a high standard. You were a politikos. You were a citizen. And that was to be respected. I think that's what we're after. The founding fathers really felt that democracy itself was inherently fully demanding of uh, participation. Um, it was, the story goes that Ben Franklin was rushed after the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia, and they said, Mr. Franklin, what kind of government do we have? And he said, you have a republic if you can keep it. Democracy is built on the little person. God knows it's not built on corporate and labor interest and, and, and special interests and lobbyists. We have all of those players, but that's not what gives me hope. What gives me hope is that individual citizen who has nothing to gain and still finds his or her way to the polls and, makes the, and takes their best shot. Wow. You lose that, you've lost the country. Now, I think we came in, frankly, pretty good danger of losing that. And again, we want to emphasize this notion that when you come back over here to culture and society, it starts here. Do you teach your children to be responsible? Do you teach them to work hard? Do you teach them to tell the truth? This is why Washington and the cherry tree wasn't, you know, whether it was factually true or not, it was morally true. It was useful to say to the young kids, don't lie. And compare that to a lot of the situation ethics nonsense that goes, that, that, that passes for wisdom today. Similarly here, is it your expectation that as you get more successful, that means you can leave for the lake on the weekend, skip all your civic responsibilities, and as long as you're selfishly fine, you're okay? Or does that mean we need to build a little sense of guilt in that says, hey, what have you done for your country lately? What have you done for your neighbors? If God's been good to you, what are you doing to help somebody that's had a tougher time? These two things are at the core of this. When we talk about citizenship, we get to hear a fourth. You design this after you've designed the first three. In that framework, citizenship and community are far broader than government and politics. And we got to start with the notion of, of looking how broad it is. You know, if, if you think about it, community life, working, raising a family, participating in religious activities, volunteerism, these are at the core of what de Tocqueville described as America, and these are at the core of what we have to be willing to reassert is at the essence of this country. So I'm more interested in how much time are you willing to put into rejuvenating America, not how much can I raise your taxes to rejuvenate America. 